Thank you very much. This is my first visit to Brazil. I'm having a wonderful time. When I left New York, it was snowing. So thank you. Um, I have kind of a problem. I'm trying to speak slowly so that the translator can keep up and you can keep up. But I'm also the only thing standing between you, 900 people, and beer. <laughs> I'll split the difference. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about user research. And uh, I'm going to start with a video. I've never had a video in my presentation ever before. This is my first time. Pray for me. <laughs> and this video is fresh. This video is from, like, yesterday, as a matter of fact. So let's see what the president has to say. <laughs> the sound is on. That will help. Grandpa Chris, by the way, did this to use an analogy. Um, when we came into office, we heard a lot of complaints about the financial aid forms that families have to fill out to get federal financial aid. Uh, and I actually remember applying for some of that stuff and remember how difficult and confusing it was. And Arnie Duncan over at Education worked with a team to see what we could do to simplify it and make a big difference. Uh, and that's part of the process that we've got to go through. And in fact, uh, you know, if we can get some focus groups and, and we sit down with actual users and see you know, how, how well this works, what we put what, what part of it didn't you understand? That, that all, I think, uh, is part of the, uh, what we're going to be working on uh, in the weeks ahead. You heard it. Actual users. Really, is the researcher in chief, or he should have he should have been a little earlier this year. Um, this is really exciting for a lot of us. Um, how many of you have struggled over your careers, long or short, to get people in your organization, on your teams, your colleagues, to believe that user research has value? How many? Put your hand up. All right, well, celebrate. You guys did it. We won. <laughs> we won. <laughs> All right, the, the victory isn't even we distributed. The future never is. But we've, we've kind of made the point, many people, including the president now, that uh, user research, that listening to people, observing people who interact with our systems is actually a good idea. Thank goodness. So we can all stop now. We can just rest in our laurels. Well, I want to tell you a story about my experience. I still do a little bit of consulting once in a while. And the victory that I'm seeing, hello, hello, try this, victory isn't really what it's all made out to be, we may not have won the war, we may have won a battle along the way, but the war may not be won yet, so let's take a look at victory, so as I mentioned, when I do consulting, I work often with large organizations, and uh, they bring me in to uh, help them get a better sense of, obviously, their information architecture, but that always leads to the discussion of user research. And so I ask questions. What kind of user research do you do? Uh, and um, often the, the people who bring me in are, still not working, are people who work in places uh, like you. Uh, they're, they're user researchers. They may have a human factors or an HCI background. And, um, they uh, are, are the kind of people who um, are used to observing users, usability testing, you know, us, basically. And I say, well, that's great. Um, uh, what kind of research do you have? And they share it with me. But usually I know in a large organization there's more going on. And I ask, well, what else are you doing? And they don't always know. And so I have to ask them questions. So with this client, I said, well, my favorite thing to do is look at search analytics. Is anybody doing that anywhere? And they scratch their heads and give me a dumb look. So I have to keep pushing them, and it may take me months, but eventually I'll find that there is someone who has access to this type of data. But there's more. So I ask questions about things like call centers as a source of user research. And uh, with this particular client I'm thinking about, it took something like nine months 
to turn up the call center data in some far distant city where they didn't even know they had an office. We find other stuff. There's other types of user research, obviously, like uh, the analytics data that's uh, not necessarily search related, uh, quick stream analysis, and so forth. And I try to get access to that, and that's not always so easy. And uh, I also found uh, with this particular client that I was working with, they had voice of the customer research, which is often uh, very much survey based. And they also had um, reports from CRM, customer relationship management applications. And they also had a research center, uh, really smart people with PhDs, paid to do really cool things that never made, never saw the light of day. Uh, and they had a, a, an outside company that they'd hired to do mental model work, which made me really happy because that was the first book that my company published, it was on mental models, but uh, it took me a long time to find out that anyone was doing this type of work. It was so important for understanding the kind of user experience that needed to, to happen. They also had other companies helping them. So there was something I'd never heard of before called brand architecture that they brought an agency in to do. And the brand architects have their own methodology, their own tools for finding out what's inside of customer's heads. And then they just kept going. They had uh, NPS, Net Promoter Score Survey Based Data. It was just unbelievable. Think about this. First of all, it was really hard for me to even know who, who to talk to to find out if this stuff existed. But it generally does exist inside a large organization. It's there. The people who are doing this type of work, all these different types of work, don't know each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't even know each other exists. And I have to push them as an outsider to meet and learn about each other. And then think about all the money that an organization like the one I'm talking about was spending. Unbelievable amounts of money. And yet, this organization, by the way, is one you're all familiar with. They move money around. They're in California. You recognize their name and you complain about their product bitterly. Everything they do seems to suck. They spend all this money, they have all these really smart people, they have all these methods, all this data, and no insight. They don't put these things together in any kind of way that leads to synthesis. So what's the problem that we have here? I like the fable of the blind man with the elephant. I'm sure you're familiar with it. The blind man with the elephant. Blind men are out walking as they always seem to be doing. They're out on a walk, and they just happen to bump into an elephant. And of course, they don't know that it's an elephant. And so one blind man touches the trunk and says, oh, this must be a snake. Another blind man touches the, one of the legs and says, no, 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 that's a tree. Very obviously a tree. And so on and so forth. And none of them figures out that it's an elephant until they all talk. And herein lies the problem. No talking goes on. No synthesis from all these different blind men who all have a different perspective on the same problem, on that elephant. So there's no synthesis, and the ergo, no insight. And that's why design often still sucks, especially in large organizations that seem to be spending more than enough money on the research to help them make better design decisions. So, I think there's a good opportunity here. You know, people don't talk, but when they get an opportunity to talk, they actually find that they go well together, that they do complementary things, that their perspectives actually not only fit together well, but support each other. And that synthesis is a beautiful thing to behold when it does happen. So I want to explore now some of the dichotomies, the differences that are complementary, to how a lot of people who do one form of user research or another fit together or could fit together. So, a lot of us are really good at understanding the what. Think of analytics people. Their data is all about what is happening. It's all behavioral. A lot of us are really good at answering the why question. Why do people do the things they do? Analytics is not good at telling us why. A lot of qualitative methods 
are good at telling us why, but they don't have that foundation of data that often shows them what they should be studying. So um, these things actually kind of fit together pretty nicely, the what and why people, the what and why methods, the what and why data. There's certainly um, another interesting dichotomy in terms of quantitative and qualitative people and research and so forth. So um, it might be a little hard to make out, but, and, and this is, by the way, unfair and gross stereotyping, but the quantitative people are the ones interested in numbers and Star Trek, and the qualitative people are the ones interested in empathy, and um, they, they're afraid of numbers, and ability to match shirt with shoes. There you go. Another dichotomy. Many of us are really focused on users' goals. Many of us are actually focused on organizational goals. Those things obviously don't always line up. But it's a really sad situation when we don't take the opportunity to line those up. And, uh, and to see where they do overlap. So there is another dichotomy there. People who are responsible for furthering the organization as it tries to achieve its goals. And people who are trying to help users achieve their goals. Now, a lot of this is information that helps us better understand the world we know. And we often measure how things are going. We have goals, so we express our goals as maybe as key performance indicators, KPI, or some other measurable metric. And then we want to figure out how our sites, our software, our systems are performing. That's great. But that's very different than using the same data in many cases to explore the world that is unknown. So we may rely on reports that we designed months or years ago to answer the same questions over and over again. But we don't think to ask new questions. And so that exploratory approach of looking at data, playing with it, learning new things that you would only understand or detect if you look at the data is really pretty critical. Another dichotomy. Some of us really like numbers and facts. Some of us really like descriptive data that tells us things that are semantic, that tells us things about customer intent, the different kinds of data in many cases. And a lot of us, when we went to college and decided what we were going to study, in many cases, whether we realized it or not, made our decisions based on whether we were comfortable with one of those or the other. So very complementary perspectives. Okay, so let's put these together a bit. And I'm just going to pick on two perspectives. A little cutoff, this is called my table of highly overgeneralized dichotomies. And on the left column is web analytics, the right column is user experience, and I've summarized some of the things we were just talking about. So the web analytics people, when, you know, what do they analyze? They're often looking at um, user's behavior. Uh, user researchers are often looking at user's intentions. And we use different data to do that. Uh, the methods may be quantitative for the, for the web analytics people and very qualitative for the user experience people. Uh, what we're trying to achieve, some of us are really focused on organizational goals, some on users' goals. How we use data, measurement and performance versus looking for patterns, learning about trends, uncovering surprises. And then finally, what kind of data many of us on one side use statistical data, on the user experience side, we may use more descriptive or semantic data. So these things fit together really pretty well, pretty nicely if you take the opportunity to do that fitting. So I want to explore four themes now to help give us some framework to start putting these things together. And I'm sorry, I don't know if I can stand somewhere that's a little less interfering with the audio. Um, uh, I have to keep jumping back here because my my brand new batteries, I guess, aren't working. So I apologize for that. OK. So the four themes I want to explore are balance, cadence, conversation, and perspective. So uh, again, a framework for trying to put together things that are not together now, but very well, maybe complementary, and to create conditions for synthesis. So let's start with balance. Now this is the ugliest slide on the planet. 
I couldn't have made an uglier slide if I tried. My slides are pretty ugly. And yet, I think it's one of the most brilliant things. I don't think there's a presentation I've given in years now that they can use this slide. It's um, by Christian Rohr, uh, a guy who's now at um, uh, McAfee, who's a veteran user experience a team leader. And what he tried to do is make sense of all the various methods that he and his colleagues on different teams use on a regular basis. So he did a pretty interesting thing. He took two axes, one which is data source, another which is approach, and essentially mapped these research methods around these four quadrants. This is fantastic. This, is, this makes sense for many of us of stuff that's overwhelming, first of all. And then it's actually a pretty useful tool to help us figure out, well, what kind of user research are we doing and what kind of research should we be doing? For example, you may find as you inventory what you do that everything fits in the lower left corner, that lower left quadrant. That's one kind of blind man, and that's not enough. So you should be thinking about getting other blind men to help you see that elephant. And so you might think about other methods on the other quadrants to balance out your user research regimen, your program. The balancing act also goes to your analysis. You may take the same data, and again, have different people look at it, to give you a balanced perspective on what you can learn from that data. So here's, again, my favorite thing, which is um, uh, search analytics data. Two, two lines, two activities from a, a log. Uh, IP address, uh, the same IP address for both. Uh, the time is the same, two seconds apart, just one session. First time the user searched Linson's plate and got zero results. The second time they searched license plate and got 146 results. Now, you're all looking at this, and your mind's on data, your brain's on data are doing different things because you're different people with different perspectives. So some of you are saying, well, the problem here is spelling, and uh, I want my search engine to do something differently in the way it handles misspelling. And some of you are thinking about, well, conversions, and are we converting this query properly, and so forth. So different people are going to look at the same data with different eyes and come up with some interesting conclusions. Same data, balanced analysis of that data. Sometimes the, the um, methods that we use can be more balanced as well. So here's a persona from Adaptive Path. Uh, Steven does all kinds of things. He's all, got all kinds of projects he works on and ways he works. Why not take that fictional thing that a lot of people won't appreciate because it is fictional and beef it up, make it stronger with some, some data. So what about what Stephen searches? Can we use something like search analytics? Again, my favorite thing, but I don't want you to think that's all I care about. Um, and add something about what you might search. It's actually based on data that we have. That might make your persona a little more useful, but also a little bit more respected by people who tend to be more data-driven. Again, a more balanced approach with a specific method. So that's the first theme, balance. I want to talk a little bit about cadence. Um, cadence is the idea of really balancing the user research view, except over time. Not in just terms of methods, but making those methods have a, a, a reasonable, rational rhythm. So uh, Whitney Cleasonberry, who happens, happens to be one of our authors, um, created this. This is a cadence for user research where She's showing essentially how things like customer service log review, uh, different types of analytics, user research and field studies can be timed differently, they have different lengths, and the visualization helps you make sense of what's happening when, and you might be able to identify areas where it looks a little bare, where there may be some gaps. So it's another potentially good diagnostic tool to help you work out a regimen that makes sense over time. And there's another version of that where I simply said, all right, what do we do and what can we do in terms of user research? There are probably certain things we, sh we should be looking at doing really often because things change really often. Users change, content changes, the world changes. So why not look at things like 
uh, doing some call center data analysis, some task analysis on a weekly basis, doing other things that are a little more expensive, a little more involved on a quarterly basis, some things on an annual basis, uh, but doing a net promoter short credit. I think that is when we marry the cadence to the balance. So not only looking at the methods, but making sure that within each um, time period, like weekly versus quarterly versus annually, we have some balance in terms of behavioral versus attitudinal, going back to that Christian Rohr landscape of user research methods, uh, quantitative versus qualitative and so forth. So we're having different blind men show up on a weekly basis in a balanced way. Other blind men, a balanced group of them showing up on a quarterly basis and so forth. Okay, so that's Katie. Third theme, conversation. One of the biggest problems that we have when we're getting different people of any type together to do hard work and, and work on tough problems is that we don't share the same language. Um, many of you have been very kind to me. You told me that the polar bear book was very helpful for you, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, I feel like we got lucky with that book because we wrote it at a time where there were very few people, or there were very many people starting to be interested in how you organize information in the context of the web, but they were coming from different backgrounds and different disciplines, and they couldn't really have a good conversation. And all we really did with that book, I think, is come up with a bunch of concepts and vocabulary that were common, that described the problem in ways that people from different disciplines could use. So it was a common set of terms, a common vocabulary, and then those people could actually have a productive conversation. That's kind of what we're trying to do right now with these different silo types of user research. So Dave Gray, who I really um, love his work, we just signed him to do a book actually. Um, he does a lot of work uh, helping bridge silos of different types in different organizations. And um, so I talked to him about this problem of people from different perspectives trying to do user research. And he said, you know, you should look at boundary objects. Boundary objects are things that lie at the boundary between fields of different perspectives. And they may be common objects, but the different fields use different vocabulary to describe them. So, um, for example, uh, some groups may talk about goals, other groups may talk about KPI. It may mean the same thing, not always, but enough that now they have something in common. Or they may talk about user segments, Others may talk about personas. Maybe those are similar enough. So I, I encourage you to, to look at the boundaries between different disciplines, the ones that you're in, the ones that other people are in, and together, when you can, have conversations about what is common to you, and realize that maybe using different language, but you're talking about the same thing. Those boundary objects are really valuable. They're the foundation for a new vocabulary. We're talking about user research and design. Um, Dave actually um, took the idea further. He didn't invent boundary objects, but he talks about the boundary matrices, which are a bit more involved. Uh, unfortunately, the URL for the way he shows you how to do that is cut off at the bottom, but I will tweet a URL to these slides a few minutes after we're done with this presentation. You can download it and get the URL. Okay. Another way to have better conversations is, this is going to sound totally contrary and totally fascist. It's to ban words. Actually ban words. I've done this, bear with me. Some words that we use are meaningless. We don't even realize it. We use them all the time. Words like redesign. Words like social. None of these, these things don't really mean anything. They're not solutions to anything because we, we use them to mask over true diagnosis. We cover up our lack of knowledge of what the real problem is. And these words are code. They allow us to keep moving forward without having stopped long enough to identify and solve true problems. And so I encourage you to think about words that really you use all the time but actually don't mean anything. And so I've given you a few examples. Like when you talk about people as the Amish people or the balsamic people, when that's not really what they're there for. They're not there to feed platform or a piece of software, they're there to solve problems. What are the problems that lie behind those words? 
That's really critical. Or the type of methods we use. If you're a usability testing person, I don't know if that's really what you, you're about. It's a method, but it's not really why you're there. Same thing for different departments, disciplines, outcomes. If we can keep these words out of the conversation, then the conversation very quickly becomes more productive. So try it. Trust me. Trust me on this one. Now, Jared School is here somewhere, uh, speaking tomorrow. He told me a story so long ago, maybe 15 years ago, and I still remember it. He told me a story of how um, uh, there was a, a big uh, online clothing store in the state, and the web team was looking at their search analytics, and they found that people were searching for product ideas called SKUs, same thing. And nobody was finding anything. They were searching the company's website using the company's own product code, SKUs, getting zero results. And they were horrified. And of course, the problem is easy to fix. You just add the product ID to the product catalog page. But they wondered, where do people get these product ideas? So they used the, the data, the analytics data, to figure out what was going on. And fortunately, the solution was easy. But they didn't understand why. And so what they did was they did an epic field study. And they found that customers, when they visited them in their home, had printed catalogs that had been coming for decades. And they would leaf through these high resolution uh, printed catalogs, do their browsing. But when it came time to order, they would rather use the website than call a toll free phone number. Because then you don't have to deal with people. So that's kind of interesting. But what I really like about the story is how they combined methods. They used analytics and a field study together to really get an understanding of problem much more deeply as well as more practically. That's really revolutionary. Putting these things together. Do you have stories like that? Can you, can you tell stories like that? Sometimes having a good conversation is just a matter of getting outside your comfort zone and making yourself have a good conversation. So uh, someone I've worked with uh, in the past, a woman named Samantha Starmer, uh, told me a story of how she worked at a large online retailer in Seattle. And uh, she was running the user experience team. And she knew marketing people had not only a lot of power, but a lot of research. And that research would be really, really helpful. And so what she started doing was she did this crazy, crazy thing. She left the building where she worked, where her office was on this company's campus, and walked across the campus carrying candy to the building where marketing was. And she sat around and um, sat in the cafeteria with her candy and tried to encourage people to sit down with her and bought people lunch and gave them candy and eventually she got to know everyone and made friends and started learning about what marketing knew about, learning their market research, but also teaching them what she knew about. And eventually it led to not only a, a first a brown bag series, a, a series of lunches where people from the different groups started presenting their research, but eventually it, it led to a unified customer research team spanning all these different silos of marketing and user research, user experience and so forth. That's radical. And it just took her getting out of the building and having conversations that she wasn't going to ordinarily, unless she made the effort to do so. Okay. Last theme is perspective. Maybe it would be better to call this sense making. Um, Part of the problem is that we work in these huge organizations. And even if our organizations are not big, it's hard to know what's going on. It's hard to make sense of the whole. It's really hard to see the elephant. So we've already talked a little bit about the idea of mapping the environment. Uh, and you guys, a lot of you, are, especially the ones uh, who are visual designers, uh, are natural mappers. You can draw pictures much nicer than the one I showed you that Christian Rohr the landscape is user research map. But that is really a great visual map. He's not the only one trying to do this. Uh, 
You may be familiar with a guy named Avinash Kaushik, who's probably like the biggest name at this point in web address. Avinash has a map. Same kind of idea. What he's trying to make sense of different methods like clickstream analysis and multiple outcomes analysis and so forth. Now, Christian's map is, is imperfect and reflects his bias. Avinash, his map is imperfect and reflects his bias. In fact, I asked him about it a little bit and this is what he told me. While I have a bucket for voice of customer, that's the sort of qualitative research side of things, in hindsight, I should have worked harder and still to paint the full qual and quant picture. He's feeling uncomfortable. He knows he's only scratched the surface of the map. But as we see more of these maps, we're going to do an increasingly good job of synthesizing them and creating a true map of the environment and ways there are to learn about our users and our customers and figure out what's inside their heads to really truly listen to them. But I think maps are, while they're good, we can go further. And I want to explore another idea where we look at containers as a way to make sense, as a way to gain perspective. Containers are things that, um, if maps help us see things differently, containers help us do things differently. I want to give you the example of uh, the folks at MailChimp. MailChimp is a really great uh, mailing list or newsletter tool for me you're familiar with. And one of the reasons it's so good is because they have such a good user experience team uh, run by a guy named Aaron Walter. Um, and MailChimp is struggling like a lot of other organizations. Not, they're not even a very big organization, but they were already drowning analytics, data, and information about why people were closing accounts, and comments on their blogs, and on and on and on. And their team is drowning. So what they did was something just pretty simple-minded, but powerful nonetheless, and any one of us can do this. They started using Evernote as a shared bucket through all their user research. So they basically, you know, dumped it all in there. They could email stuff, in many cases in an automated way, straight into um, Evernote. And Evernote does all these like simple but really useful things like OCRing or scanning uh, text that is currently in, in Bitmap, as well as making everything searchable by indexing all that content in one place. So all of a sudden, the researchers could ask questions of not only the data they knew, but the data they didn't know they had, the data that was from some other silo, and get answers that were not only rich and exposed them to other blind men, but answers that were better because all the data was in one place. So that was an, ex an incredibly powerful move forward for MailChimp, and uh, I can point you to an article where Aaron writes about the experience in the list part. Now, I talked about maps, I talked about containers. I'd like to kind of put them together, but I'm lost here. It sort of seems like we're heading towards some idea of a dashboard for user research that doesn't just show us visually where everything is, but also starts fitting it together. And imagine things like if you could have dials that show task analysis reports and how they connect into your analytics and how that then can connect into your field studies and show the sequencing and that's exciting but all of a sudden the metaphor of dashboards gets exposed for what it is which is a metaphor and it can only take us so far so those things start to break down pretty quickly i don't know how we're going to put this together but i know it's going to get put together maybe with a different metaphor i'm hoping maybe some of the people in the room are going to figure that out So I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I mentioned Dave Gray. He wrote a really good book for O'Reilly about, I think it's two years old now, maybe a year old, uh, on the connected company. And Dave is talking about all kinds of ideas and practical ways to get cross-silo conversations and activities going. He doesn't really talk about user research, but I think what he talks about is something that we can start using and learning from. I also think it's the sort of thing that many of our senior leaders are, are struggling with. It's their problem, it's our problem too, and it may be a common point of conversation. And my really my final question for you is this. If you had the opportunity to start anew with a clean slate, 
start from scratch. And for your organization, you could build the brain, the thing that gathered evidence and put it together to make decisions about not just design, but really everything. I bet you it wouldn't look anything like the way things have organically come together for your organization today. I promise you. How would it look if you did have that opportunity? Is this something that you can answer together with senior leaders? I think it would look very different. And so I encourage you to, to maybe start thinking ahead a bit. Maybe you'll be running your own organization and you won't let it evolve in a kind of disjointed way where it's kind of like a brain Lots of neurons and no synapses. Lots of blind men and none of them are seeing help. So that's hopefully a good next battle for those of us who have committed our lives to use the research to, to fight. And uh, go get it. Good luck with it. Thank you.